Thank you for meeting uh, today before your trip to Latvia. You were the first EU uh, institutional leader who went to Kyiv and expressed uh, support uh, for Ukraine. But still in this house some MEPs don't think that there's anything wrong with Russian invasion. Why do you think is that? Well, I would rather focus on the fact that ever since uh, the date uh, of the Russian invasion, uh, and it's important to continue to call it the Russian invasion, uh, on the 24th of February, the majorities that we have seen in this parliament uh, are absolutely clear, unprecedented and overwhelming. In fact, whereas before you'd have much more narrow votes, especially when talking on gas supply, taxonomy, who's reliant on, on gas from Russia, uh, the voice has been super strong and absolutely loud and clear. With regards to those members who take a different view, my take is that we are all a accountable to our voters. We are elected from our countries and our electorate in 2024 needs to make judgment or to pass judgment on our work. And I think any statements on, let's say, the extreme fringes of the political landscape will have to ta be taken into account by the voters then. In the Baltic states, but also in Poland, uh, we are a little bit worried that uh, European support for Ukraine might wear out, especially we are worried about the southern European uh, countries. What do you think what the mood is and for how long can we hold uh, on to this unity? I come from a southern European country uh, and I was also a little bit concerned, just like for all, let's say, challenges, the further away you are, the more distant you feel and also the fact that we are facing huge uh, challenges at home with the cost of living cri crisis, rising inflation and interest rates. However, wh what I have seen is, is really quite the opposite. What we have to admit is that we did not pay heed to our Baltic colleagues and our Polish colleagues for so many years telling us we have a problem. Russia is going in this direction. Putin did not stop in 2008. He did not stop in 2014-15. Now we have seen he will not stop either. When we saw the escalation, both with the partial mobilization and then with, uh, with the indiscriminate bombing and shedding of, uh, of uh, main cities in Ukraine and all over the country, I think any fatigue that would have set in is, has reached actually the complete opposite. Leaders are still very strong in their language. Um, responsibility means that we have to take decisions both in terms of the war and helping Ukraine win it, but also on the other hand, taking, making sure that our citizens um, uh, uh, are cushioned from the social and economic impact uh, of the war and the energy crisis. And thirdly, that we are ready to take courageous decisions in terms of understanding where we are with defence and security as a whole EU, not only NATO, but EU member states as well. And also that when we're talking about energy, the final ultimate goal re re remains complete decoupling and removal of dependency from Russia for gas. But still, I mean, that cannot be done overnight. It's still going to take time. So this winter in Europe going to be tough in terms of the energy prices and how much people pay for the heating. So we can expect some social unrest as well. And there will be pressure piling on the national governments. So it will be very difficult for the Europe to stay united uh, in terms uh, of its support to Ukraine, right? I think the unity has been again unprecedented if any of us would have thought on the 24th of February that we would have adopted eight packages of sanctions that we but would they didn't continue. come easy oh, especially no. the last but ones. they are still coming through because uh, there is no choice the European Union needs to send the strongest of messages that our fundamental values that the Ukraine uh, the Ukrainian people are fighting for are the same values that we share and believe in and that when we look at Ukraine we have to think what could come next once Russia um, escalates, if Russia escalates, and if we don't help Ukraine push back the, the invasion. What I would also say is that the, we need to be able to take the decisions on, uh, in order to cushion that unrest. When energy bills are going up, what is our solution? Already today, we are less than 9% reliant on Russia for gas. We, the numbers were in the high 80s uh, at the beginning of the war. We thought we wouldn't find enough supplies to fill our storage capacity. We are at 85 to 86% of our goal, even weeks ahead we thought we would do it. 
in January and February, we might need to already start to think about our storage capacities again. In fact, this parliament is asking for us to talk about it already now, while at the same time making sure that on, en on all the energy and emergency emer uh, energy mechanisms, we act as efficiently and as quickly as possible. So I think when we talk about decisions, we are the ones who have to take them, we are the ones who have to explain them, and if that requires that our budgetary priorities and the way we allow member states to look at capping the, the market, the, the prices, decoupling um, the gas from electricity, that has to be made possible because but, otherwise our citizens but are But if we to take this sort of from the high level to be, to be more on a concrete level, mm -hmm. how much is European Parliament willing to do itself, I mean, in this mm -hmm. energy saving time, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. this winter will be? Mm -hmm. uh, are you still going on with heating of mm -hmm. two buildings, one in the Strasbourg mm -hmm. and one in, the, one in, in, in Brussels? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people would say that's a lot of waste of energy. Yeah, everybody has to make uh, um, take the responsibility for and all And everybody the has to make sacrifices. And the European Parliament is taken, ready to take sacrifices. Absolutely, we can provide with whole lists of, of immediate measures that we have taken. Um, some are need, need to be immediate, some can be done today, some can be done in the, in the medium term and some can be done in the longer term. Immediately, I would tell you, for example, that the electricity and the heating is being completely shut off when the building is not being used. Same for all buildings, whether in Brussels, whether in Strasbourg or even in Luxembourg where we have a, a, a large amount of, of staff that work just like all the other institutions uh, in different services but we also in the longer term looking at solar panels in the beginning of next year using of heat pumps in in countries where where they are put in uh, even when we're talking about switching off the lights and making our energy much more energy much more efficient in all the decisions that we take what we have also commissioned and I have done that is asked all the services to put in a cost analysis of every single thing that could be looked at from an energy saving point of view. Is it easy? No. Is it easier in some buildings than others? Yes. So we are actually looking building by building to see where our thousands of employees who are working on, on, on laws, legislation, interpretation, translation, and also making sure um, that we deliver on the, on the needs that our citizens want and also for our members is something that can be, can, can be costed, explained and delivered. But in this time of crisis, European Parliament is still considering buying new buildings in Strasbourg. Why? There it's not about purchasing. Uh, we are, what we are doing is precisely what I've just said about cost assessment. So we are doing the cost and needs assessment of all the members uh, and, and in all the buildings that we have, whether we, the, 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 the institutions own them or rent them. So for example, this parliament has made huge amount of savings because of the fact that it bought buildings decades ago rather than rented them. This is a building strategy that has been uh, decided by my predecessors very long ago. Uh, at the moment what is happening is because of the fact that some buildings uh, require either uh, in, um, energy analysis, environmental compliance, not because of our initiative but because of the cities that uh, we are located in and it is those needs and cost assessments that are leading us to look at what could possibly be done. It is not about purchasing, it is not about selling, it is not about different options, it is about what the European Parliament and other institutions, because let me remind you as well that when the European Parliament sits in Strasbourg, the European Commission is present as well, what the needs are and I can assure you that I will do everything in my power to keep the costs and energy efficiency as, as, as uh, the cost low and the energy efficiency as high as possible. If we go back to the situation in Ukraine, uh, we all say that Ukraine has to win this war, uh, but how this victory will look like? So we would assume that the Russian army is pushed out uh, back to the uh, pre-war borders, uh, Crimea, yes, no, and what's going to happen to Russia and how we as Europe will build our relationship with Russia after the end of the war? I think we should ask our Ukrainian friends who are fighting every day for their lives and for their country what they would consider to be the end of the war. Why do I say this? Because I think, first of all, the time for appeasement is over. President Zelensky has been asked this and has correctly, in my view, answered that I'm the one, together with my countrymen, fighting this war. You are telling me to win it. I need more arms. I need more financial and political um, assistance. And I need to make sure that, that Russia does not escalate. I'm the one defending myself. At the moment, when we look at a war, we look at 
two sides, but this is one, a one-sided invasion, a brutal, illegal, unjustified invasion that threatens or has already been threatening the territorial sovereignty and integrity of a country. When that stops, that is when the war will stop. Until then, we will continue helping Ukraine. When Russia withdraws the army from Ukrainian territory, is Europe willing to lift the sanctions right away? I will not answer that question uh, at the moment, uh, and I tell you why. First of all, we have to see whether the sanctions have been implemented, how they have been enforced, where are the gaps, and how they have been filled. With previous packages of sanctions in different parts of the, of the world that had, they have been adopted, we have seen the impact and how they have been implemented and their effect. The same thing and the same analysis would have to be done step by step. So, meaning Russia, you cannot tell what Russia exactly has to do in order to have all sanctions lifted? I would like Russia to stop invading Ukraine and bombing its civilians indiscriminately. And when it does that, and when Russia withdraws its army, can then sanctions be lifted? I would like to see that that happen. That and Russia withdraws its army and stops bombing its, its civilians. Okay. Thank you so much for the interview. Thank, Thank you. you.